Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back, and we have the incredible Penelope Holt, and we're going to be talking about her incredible book, The Angel Scroll. And yes, Miss Liz has a choppy voice today, so it's a little crackly, but I'm fine, guys. I have my cup of tea here, and I'm all good. So before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel, and we're going to get you to ring that little doorbell so you can watch these tea times at any time, morning, afternoon, evening, in your car, in your home, at an event. Uh, all that good stuff. Uh, there, what does Miss Liz offer you? Well, I offer you over 300 plus interviews with incredible people from all walks of life, from all different globes. So let's get over with the disclaimer and I'll do a little bit of the bio with Penelope and then I'll get Penelope in here. And today's tea we're serving is transform, enlighten and action. And if you'd like to know more about Miss Liz's tea, you can check out the website at www.misslizesteatime.com and we'll be talking a little more in the show as we go on. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, it may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the panelists' discussion, uh, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcome you. And should you find that the show is not made for you today, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. Now, a little bit about my guest who's waiting in the back room. Uh, I have Penelope Holt. She was born and educated in England and now lives in New York. She is a novelist, playwright, business writer, and marketing executive who work whose work has been performed at the Edinburgh Fringe Fringe Festival, York Art Center, and New York American Folk Theater. In addition to writing fiction, The Angel Scroll and The Apple, based on the con controversial Herman Rosen Rosblatt Holocaust romance. Halt is a perfect prolific writer, editor, and co-author of non-fiction, including Singing God's Work, the story of the Harlan Gospel Choir, Emotional Intelligence at Work, and many other works. She is married to, with two children. Let me get her in here and let's spill some tea. Let me get Penelope in here. Welcome, Penelope. Welcome. I was just thinking you need a good tea for your throat, honey and ginger. <laughs> Ginger and turmeric, a nice green tea, nice chamomile tea. Yeah, my 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 voice is just a little cracked, but I'm good. I have my honey my honey lemon tea here, so it should it should help. Uh, so Penelope, let's get started with who you were as a little girl and who you are now as a grown woman. Well, you know, it's funny as you look back, you see how you've sort of stayed the same. Like a lot of those sensibilities that you have as a child, you still feel like the same person. Right. And I think in a way that is um, that's the shock of getting older because you feel exactly the same on the inside and you look completely different on the outside. Um, I always loved reading. I always loved books. I always loved words, talking. I, I tell the story. My mom said that I could speak in complete paragraphs and I was two. I was wow. yeah, talking hens and chickens to death at three. 
So I was always a big talker. So I've always just been fascinated with words. Uh, they're powerful, you know, they're, they're, they're transformative, which we're gonna talk about. Um, shamans use them to change reality for people to, you know, you, you, you think differently, you speak differently, you become different, you transform. So, um, but I think I'm still sensitive, um, you know, still a little thin skinned, I think, um, playful. I like to have playful conversations. I think conversations go bad much better when you're playful, you know, rather than too serious. Um, I could always bounce back. I think I'm pretty resilient. I think I've just learned the power of discipline as I've gotten older and I've, you know, I've emigrated and taken on, I've tried to be brave. I'm not particularly brave physically. Like I don't like skiing and things and falling off bikes and breaking stuff. But uh, I tend to be pretty um, brave emotionally and psychologically. It takes a lot to leave, to leave your home country, leave your, leave your family, you know, leave your culture and, and travel 3000 miles to a place where you really don't know anyone. So, so I think I think those, I think I think, very much the same, but you know, with some big differences. I married someone who was very opposite than me, and so opposites I opposites attract, right? Opposites <laughs> attract, and they also drive each other crazy. Um, but I think when you live with someone who is very opposite uh, than you, um, it can be a challenge because there's a lot of conflict. But you sort of get a two for one because their qualities rub off on you, and your qualities rub, rub off on them. So that's, that's been, I, I say, if you're going to go into relationships, go into the ones that make you grow. Yes. Right. Yeah, go, absolutely. Go, go into relationships with friends or partners that will hold up a mirror and, and see yourself so that you can see yourself and who, who will challenge you and give you a different perspective and a different point of view. Because I think, um, I think there's no point just smoking your own stuff and believing your own propaganda and drinking your own tea, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Penelope, I like that you said the opposite of us because it actually does give us a different perspective on things, right? Because you might see a six, the other one, your, your spouse might see a nine, but you're still, you know, having the, a different look at life and bringing a good perspective and bringing that to the table. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I was the six and the nine flashed when I was talking. My best friend, <clears throat> who's from Mexico, she's one of eight, and that's what her dad always used to do when the, her the eight kids were fighting. He'd say, "Give one a six and one a, give uh, put the put it down, and once when they see a six and the other would see a nine, and then he'd make them to you know uh, go opposite." I thought that was a pretty good parenting technique if you've got raucous, fractious kids that are falling out. It helps you know you've got to understand what where the other person's. They call that radical empathy. Radical yeah. empathy means that you don't necessarily agree with the person but you understand their perspective yeah <clears throat> because well, and just, it makes a good it makes a good conversation too <laughs> as well you know and we, we, yeah. we were talking about that before we went live right was the conversation time yeah it, it's no point if you're just trying to uh you know knock knock down somebody else's point of view or, or could talk them out of it you, you know you can persuade them you can maybe move them, you can have a meeting of the minds. But if you're coming into a discussion or an argument, just trying to prove that someone is bad and wrong, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go very far. I like what you just said, meeting of the minds, because that's a lot to do with your book as well, right? Is the understanding of the mind and life and all of that. Uh, so when, when, I, when I say that uh, meeting of the minds, what comes to heart to you, for you, Penelope? I, lo I love harmony. Um, I, I've spent a lot of my career um, communicating it and connecting, uh, using words to connect. And of course, we use language, you know, we think, and then we use language to express how we think. Yeah. So talking language is, is, is actually just, is just uh, expressing our understanding of the world. And so I think to be able to communicate and I can tell you my view of the world and you can tell me your view and then we can have a meeting of the minds. We can learn from each other, we can grow and expand a little bit because you're telling me things that I didn't know and I'm telling you things that you don't know. But it's nice when you, um, there's some people you just, you know, for whatever reason we're, we're conditioned or, you know, we're, we're genetically different and we don't see eye to eye. Yeah. Um, 
but you just those really good friends are the ones that you know understand you and you understand them and you see the world in a similar way and those those relationships are harmonious and they're com comfortable and they're comforting because i think sometimes in the world you you know we all wake we all sit and think am i right am i wrong you know am i stupid did i get this um upside down and so it's nice when there are people in your life that reassure you and think the way that you do <clears throat> but you don't want to be talking to yourself you don't want to be in an echo chamber you always want that little bit of um being stretched and challenged but it's, it's if you're taking a nice long walk on a we were both saying how lovely fall is i love the fall yeah. if you're taking a nice long hike with a friend in the fall it's nice to have that meeting of the minds yeah Fall is my actual favorite holiday because of the changing of colors, right? It shows us that life changes, uh, you know, and yeah. it transforms. And that's one of the words that you gave me for your tea was transform, you know, uh, and we're talking about the changing colors and life and all that. But you also gave me enlightenment and action. So tell me a little bit why you gave me those three words for your tea. Well, because I think that um, I've been a lifelong learner. Um, I want to understand, you know, um, I'm curious, like, why, why, why? Because I think the more we we learn both emotionally and intellectually and particularly spiritual, spiritually, and I think enlightenment goes to spiritual understanding, right? And I think that the word that they use in tandem with that is transcendence. So the more enlightened you become, the more... Um, the more you're less in the grip of the dark energies, which are ignorance, anger, um, pettiness, bitterness, right? The more you free of all that and you're in the light, um, just the better, more peaceful your life is going to be and the more, the better effect that you're gonna have on other people, the people around you. So I, I love the idea of, I think it's a beautiful word too, the idea that enlightened, that you're gonna be like going into the light and you know, being a body of light or being a light spirit, um, angelic. I mean, my book's called The Angel Scroll. I love angels. So yeah, I love I love that. I've, I've always pursued enlightenment. I don't think you can ever um, catch it, but I like reading the works of people. I like metaphysics and the mystics and the spiritual writers, Buddhist um, masters and such, who have a degree of enlightenment and, and kind of give you the roadmap for how to get there. Yeah, so people like riding their bike. I write. I like reading about enlightenment. Last time I rode a bike, I fell off and smashed smashed my wrists and, and wound up with a pin and uh, nails in it, screws. Yeah, I I haven't ridden a bike in a long time. And the last time I rode a bike in Penelope, I got attacked by a bunch of Canadian geese, and I was like, "That's it, I'm done." <laughs> oh, did they chase you? Yeah, they chased me, and I was like, "I'm done. I'm not. I'm doing this again." <laughs> Well, people say to me, were you going fast downhill? And I was like, no, I was practically, you know, I was, in fact, I was going too slow and I yeah. wasn't turning the wheels properly. And I, and I tipped over and my daughter was next to me and she's sort of, it cramped me as I fell and it just felt the, the wrist just break. She's done sport med, sports med, We were in the middle of a gale actually down in North Carolina. So she's done sports medicine and she was really good. She got me and the two bikes back and she gave me a banana and, she made a splint using a wooden spoon and a cling film, you know, the, the, the rack. Yeah. And when I went up to the urgent care, um, the doctor said, oh my goodness, this is a great splint. Who did this for you? So. So Penelope, I want to get into your book, The, the Angel Scroll. How long, yeah, how, how did that book come about and how long did it take you to write it? Well, I was working on and off for quite a number of years. Um, because I'm a professional writer, I do it for, you know, I've done it for a living, ghostwriting and co-authoring, mostly in business. I started out as a creative writer, but in order to make a living, I moved into business writing. And you're always at the mercy of your, your client. It's their book, their ideas, you know, you have to defer. So this book, I spent a lot of time on it because it just had all of the themes and the storylines that I find interesting. It's about a spiritual seeker. She's bereaved. She's her, she's young in her thirties. Her husband has died, and she begins to have strange visions. These supernatural realms open up to her, and she is a a decent painter, but she she channels a, ma a masterpiece. And she finds out that 
it's been prophesized by a Dead Sea Scroll called the Ages Scroll, that there are three paintings, and when you put them together, they'll create miracles. And so she goes off running around the world, around Europe and Jerusalem, England, Glastonbury tour, to try and see if they can get these three paintings together and figure out what will happen when they put them together. And as she goes around, she meets all of these spiritual masters, a Benedictine monk and a Buddhist monk and a, a anthropologist of early goddish worship who studies the Druids. So you get all of these great, um, you know, facts and insights and stories about all of these different faith traditions. Um, and they're all giving her a different explanation of, of why thing, these supernatural things are happening to her. She doesn't know if it's her grief, if it's just from her unconscious, if it is the prophecy, if there's something supernatural outside of herself. So that's, all, that's the kind of stuff I'm fascinated in. So I kind of wrote the book that I wanted to read, uh, which meant that I threw some romance in and I threw in, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thriller. Um, there's good and evil, you know, they're in a race to get the, the paintings and there's, it's very mysterious and it's very spiritual. So it's got, it's got a lot of good stuff in that, in that tea bag. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in those three paintings, do they connect like a puzzle? Do they have to get them together or? They're, 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 there's marks, um, that tell them that they found okay. one of them, but it's not until they put the three of them together into a triptych, which means a three, three panel, that they actually see the effect. You know, that's putting the key in the lock when they put them all together. And then they find out what happens when they put them together. Well, and you said you added some romance and, and some humor and stuff that that in the book as well. So yeah. how long did it take you to write the book? I started researching it in the early 2000s and I finished it around 2022. I had a couple of like versions of it and the final was in 2022. And then, you know, I found a publisher for it and then they took a year. They don't publish right away. So it was almost 18 months after they accepted the book. Um, in fact, I almost forgot about it. And then it was published in um, June uh, this year, June, end of June, 2024. So it's a long process, you know, um, I've self-published books and I've been involved in self-publishing, but this one I wanted to do with a publisher, and um, but it does take a lot of time. A lot of people are making good money and they can get their books to market quicker and they keep more of the profits and the book marketing that Amazon allows you to do and, and whatnot is, um, is excellent. So, you know, once upon a time, um, it was, you know, they called it a vanity press. Uh, people didn't like to self-publish. People looked down on it. But I think now more and more, there are great books um, that yeah. are being published uh, by independent authors because the economics are better. Like if I if I buy my books to send them out to people, um, I get them wholesale, but I have to pay, you know, I've got to pay 50% of the book price where, so that racks up, you know, and yeah. that, whereas if you're publishing the book independently, you you know you're you're probably getting your books for a couple couple of dollars and you can give them away and and get them in the hands of people and talking about them and and reading them so there's a lot of I really you know endorse and encourage people if you if you want to write a book <clears throat> I think everybody should everyone's got a book in them and even if you just keep it for your kids and your grandkids or your family and I think you should do it and all of the tools are there now to um, to you know make it worth your while. I would say get a good editor because no matter how, invest in a good editor because no matter how good of a writer you are, you, um, you, um, you, you, there are things that you just miss. In fact, I've got a romance book coming out with Inkspell authors in January and the editor just sent me this, the manuscript back. And <clears throat> there's a scene where the husband comes in and he drops his gym bag on the table, on the floor. And she wrote, I thought he left his gym bag in the car with his wife. And I was like, you know, you just, you're so yeah. close to it. You, you just, you miss those little things. And I was like, oh, eagle eye, good catch. So yeah, yeah. The, the good editor will, they'll, you know, they'll help you. They'll, they'll catch mistakes and then those inconsistencies, you know. Yeah, because that book is called Polly Wants a Lover, correct? That's coming yeah, Polly Wants a Lover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, are you excited that about a, that one? 
Um, it was this angel scroll is 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 it's not heavy. It's a fun. It's a good rollicking book. But there's a lot of research. There's a lot of serious themes, metaphysics, spirituality, and I just love to write. It's my hobby. Some people do woodworking or knitting, but I just like to write. And yeah. there's a so I thought, you know, I'll try my hand at romance because there's a huge demand, especially among women, for all kinds of romance, you know, cozy or supernatural or um, historical fiction. And so I thought, yeah, I'll just do, a, um, I'll just see if I can get into this. So I did the first one um, in a series called Women Who Want. And this one is Polly Wants a Lover because, you know, Polly Wants a Cracker. I <laughs> thought it kind of be. It was just a bit silly and fun to say Polly wants a lover. So I'm going to start on the second one. And there, the thing about romance books is they're what we call trope driven. So they're the same themes and patterns, you know, friends to lovers, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, lost love, second love. <clears throat> so that you have to kind of just describe the trope. So they're, they're somewhat formulaic, which it's, in, it's amazing that people write the same themes over and over, but the books are still very different. It's just, it's like, what is it? There are seven notes or something and you, you get yeah. all of these amazing songs with just a few notes. So on the one hand, I like that it's easy, uh, that it is formulaic and you can have fun with that. But at the same time, you know, it can be a little bit limiting. The Angel Scroll is very, um, is very unusual and creative. There's a lot of different, very different things in it, but it deals with bereavement and travel and art and religion and faith and tra and transformation and and, um, and action, taking action. So it's it's a very unique book, but the the romance books are sort of cookie cutter, but I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's just fun to do on the side. Um, when you said Polly wants a cracker, that's what I thought of when I when I found the book. I was like, "Oh, is that Polly wants a cracker? Polly wants a lover." <laughs> you know, I just yeah, see this bird, Polly. Polly. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to try. I was trying to like uh, ring that bell. You know, like they'd say, "Where have I heard that before?" And and well, it brings the humor in as well, right? It shows the, the lighter side as well because romance is light, right? It's not all heavy stuff. Um, yeah, it is. And when the you mentioned about, that, uh, go ahead. I was just to say, I think the reason that many women like to read romance is that it's not necessarily that they're all happy endings, but there's usually some sense of triumph or growth. Yeah. You know, even if she walks away from the guy at the end, she's, it's because she's strong and independent. And I think there's so much in life that we can't control or that um, makes us feel like we're in a small boat in a big ocean. Yeah. And I, I think that that romance uh, is appealing because it it appeals to uh, there's romance for men too, but for women it appeals to the things that make them happy, um, you know, relationships, closeness, intimacy, uh, finding meaning, finding support and companionship. You know, all their favorite emotional themes, and then at the end, the heroine usually uh, triumphs in some way, and it just you know it just can take you out of the all of the the kind of the messy uh, uh you know your messy life where you've got a lot of uh on loose ends and yeah. there's always you know if you've got kids there's always there's cleaning and laundry and kids and grocery shopping and yeah. well you know when you said that, that that there's a high volume of looking for romance I, it it is true because i haven't seen too many romance books out there lately i see a lot of horror and science fiction and fantasy but i don't see a lot of romance books out there there's tons of them though there's i mean there's the sort of the real the harlequin which is the real trope driven the real yeah. in england we used to call them body strippers um but then there's all this the chick lit you know uh, um chick literature and there's a, there's a lot of romance genres and a lot of good writers i like Catherine. um i think her name is bybee um, I think she was a nurse and she got into romance writing and she's done um, she's done a series, tons of series. And you get a really good writer like that who will do 10, 12, 15, 20 books. And yeah. they've got a, you know, remember in back in the day it was Danielle Steele. Oh yes. Remember yes, the I've read, I've, I've read many of those. Yeah, she was prolific. And then uh, Jackie Collins, although she was she, you know, she was a little more risque. 
Yeah. Um, and so she had all those Hollywood uh, books. When you're writing romance, there's different levels of what they call heat. So there's cozy that are just sort of charming and, you know, uh, romantic all the way to you get the really steamy ones. What was that? Um, I always forget her name. The one that did Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, yeah. What was her name? It was, she had an initials, right? I always forget the, maybe somebody who's listening in knows, but yeah. It, it, so some some people are really comfortable, you know, the, uh, the, the racier the better. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm old school. I think you have to just kind of keep it, you know, slightly warm, but yeah. No blushing. So I want, I, I want to go back to the Angel Scroll because uh, I want to get that book out for you. Um, the other one's coming out in January, but the Angel Scroll, what, what would you like to see happen with that book? Well, I was actually asked to write um, a movie script. Um, someone, oh. yeah, someone who was in the business read it and loved it and said it'd be. It, I think it would be a great movie. I mean, I started out as a playwright, and so I tend to think in terms of scenes, you know, action movies. And so I was paired up with a really great writing partner who was a, um, a TV Emmy nomin Emmy award winning uh, TV director, and she and I worked on it and she, talk about meeting of the minds. She and I had just hit it off. We're so comfortable with each other. We came, became really good friends and we worked uh, really hard, put our heads down and uh, just finished the movie script. So it's tough to get a movie made, but um, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I had fun doing the script and I'd love to see it become a movie. And people who read it say, this would be a great movie because Imagine you're describing paintings. So if you could actually yeah. see these supernatural paintings that emanate light and heat, um, and there's sort of the miraculous, there's a lot of sacred geometry in it. There's a lot of angelic um, imagery. So very, uh, very sort of supernatural and, you know, powerful. You get really powerful energy. So I'd love to just, you always, as a writer, you want your book to find its audience. I just, the, yeah. You know, not every, there's a, as we say in Yorkshire, where I'm from in England, there's a pot for every lid or there's a lid for every pot. So I just want to find my lids. You know, I just want to find the, I, some, I was speaking to one lady who interviewed me. She said, I read it twice. I couldn't put it down. I read it twice. And so you just want to find those people that really love what you've created. So I like to, I like to go to book clubs. So if anyone wants me to come to a book club and they can read the book and talk about it. With me, I like to do that because you have intentions when you're writing the book, and then you find out when other people read it, it triggers uh, ideas for them that you you hadn't thought of, and that's fascinating. Yeah. Hearing there, especially this one, because it's about someone's spiritual journey, and I'm always fascinated with how people, if they believe in God or they believe in a higher power, why why did they believe? How did they get there? You know, what was what was their journey to get to that? Um, yeah. Um, who was that um, famous philosopher said that we all have a God sight, we all have a God shaped hole in our heart. Um, is it Blaise Pascal, I think said that. So, I mean, it's the, I know plenty of atheists or plenty of people who say they're atheists, um, that they feel they don't feel the need for God. But I see something far more powerful than me every time I open my front door and uh, look outside or even contemplate my own, you know, body and the birth of my children and all the mir the miracles that we just take for granted. So I am definitely on the side of a higher power. And I like to, to, I like to just hear how, what other people's faith is and what comforts them and what motivates them and what's their moral framework and how do they stay um, optimistic in the face of um, loss and defeat or, you know, how do you stay hopeful? Because yeah. I think I think sometimes when you remove God from the equation, it's harder to do those things. It's harder to feel hopeful and op optimistic, and 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 to understand that there's a reason for everything um, that you may not see at the time, but it, it it will become apparent. So I think it's just a much more uh, enlightened, uh, optimistic way of living for people who yeah. who have that faith. So Penelope, in this book, there's a lot of truth in history as well, correct? Yeah, so there's um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are real. They were found between 1946 and 57. They were in massive trove 
uh, thousands of pieces of parchment dating back to the second uh, temple period, which I think was about 300 years BC. So scholars were doing backflips because it was sort of religious, scholarly, cultural um, find. And they thought that they'd found this other angel scroll called the angel scroll in 1999. They said, oh, we've got this lost. That's when I, I heard about it in the 2000s. We found this missing scroll, the angel scroll, but they could never pin it down. Um, so eventually they said, we, you know, we can't attest that it's real because we've never really seen it. We just heard about it. But I, I took that idea of the angel scroll and that I made up that there was a, it was real and that there was a prophecy and that the prophecy was that these three paintings would be like a, a new gospel for the 21st century that people were arguing over the Bible and the different interpretations and the meanings. So you'd get these three paintings and the three paintings would be, there'd be no confusion because you would just look at the three paintings and you would have a very direct experience. You'd get their message directly penetrating you. And so I just thought that was a lovely, idea. wouldn't it be nice if you could just look at three paintings and, and be transformed, you know, be enlightened, yeah. take the proper action. So, so, I, so I used the, um, the, it, the Dead Sea Scroll that, as a jumping off point. And then Claire, my heroine, goes to Jerusalem and she goes to Glastonbury Tor and finds out all about the Druids, you know, the Druids who create Stonehenge. And um, I think one of the most charming details of the Druids is the word enchanting comes from, in part, ancient, the ancient Druids who were oh. Celts they used to enchant hillsides. So they would have these per, um, perpetual choirs that would, they would walk around the hillsides 24 seven chanting in order to enchant and make the space uh, special. And I, I never knew that was the origin, the origin that it enchanted really meant that the spiritual chanting had made the place sacred, so. So that was fascinating. And then she goes to Rome. She goes to um, she goes to Siena, where Saint Catherine, the great mystic, um, lived in, during the medieval period. She survived the Black Death. So she just she just sort of encounters all of these different um, mystics and faith traditions and uh, Buddhism. She meets a Buddhist monk and. So it's just for someone like me who's curious about that, it was it was great to research it and then try and weave it into create it into a, a work of fiction, you know. I get I could actually see it into a movie, you know, just the adventures of finding those three paintings and you know, uh who they meet, how they get to that location and stuff. Uh there's also some reincarnate uh, reincarnation in the book, correct? Yeah. And what's interesting is that scholars believed the Dead Sea Scrolls were written by the uh, uh, um, group called, a sect called the Essenes. And some people believed that Jesus was, was an Essene. There were three um, main sects, was the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we know about. He was always fighting with the Pharisees. And, but there was this other sect called the Essenes and they were separatists, they lived out by the Dead Sea um, some miles away from Jerusalem, and they wouldn't they wouldn't worship in the temple. They thought it was defiled. Now the Essenes were actually it was said scholars claim that they were influenced by the Hinduism and by uh, the Egyptian mysteries. Because remember uh, Moses was the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh, so he was schooled in the Egyptian mysteries, and he was schooled, which was inf influenced by um, Indian spirituality and Hinduism, which includes reincarnation. And so they connect the dots and they say that the Essenes believed in reincarnation. They believed they were, they did not, um, eat meat or sacrifice animals. They, that was against their religion. They were very peace loving. They were very equitable. And so all of the, a lot of the great traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Eastern, um, have, use have reincarnation as part of the but it's it's not known that that there is some connection in early christianity and and um judaic studies that tied back through moses to reincarnation so that's one of those fun you know uh facts that i wanted to um 
put into the book because it's very, I think it's very interesting, the idea that early Christians who were Essenes may have believed in reincarnation. And so it's in the book. The, the reincarnation happens in the book, but I had a, I had a, um, that was really fascinating reading about that. And some people disagree because we've got very well established, you know, records, narratives about religion and, and people, you know, buy, buy into them. But there are always these fringe theories that, um, you know, they get pushed to the side. Um, they're not embraced. <clears throat> you know, the Catholic Church shaped Catholicism a lot. You know, it was just, it was shaped depending on what the political or the cultural environment was. And so there are scholars out there that believed that Jesus went to India and um, because he was in the scene and because it would, he would have had that link, link to, um, to, to India. And in the book, my heroine, she keeps dreaming about Jesus in India. She has this dream of Jesus being in India and she paints, she paints it. He's at the, the book starts, he's at the bedside of a young woman, an Indian woman who's dying and he doesn't save her. And her husband is crying, he wants her, him to save her, but he doesn't. And so that's, the, that's her dream, you know, it's this act of imagination. So yeah, there's just a lot of, um, just a, a lot of fascinating themes that are knitted together. It, it, it's amazing that you brought that up because I, that was my next question to you was, did Jesus travel to India? Because I, I found that on your on your site. So for the listeners out there, did you want to share a little bit about why you have that? And Yeah, um, it's, it's this idea that he was in a scene and that he was influenced by Hinduism and in the gospels, he goes to the temple when he's a boy at 12, but then there you don't hear much until he begins his, his ministry around th age 30. So they call those the hidden years. And they, they sort of say, what did he do during those hidden years? And there's this theory. There's some scholarly research that there's accounts from India that talk about him being there. But again, people argue it. You know, Some people are adamant it didn't happen. Other people um, lay claim to prove that he did. And so I just thought that was as, uh, fascinating that in those hidden years, he would have, he would have gone around and, um, you know, met with other, you know, masters or um, traveled in that way. And so that's, there's a, some great, there's a book called Jesus in India, but if you don't feel like reading, you and I were talking that people now we're, uh, you know, the uh, audio <laughs> listeners, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm auditory. I mean, I love to read, um, but I'm, I'm very auditory. I, I learn through listening. But there's a, some really good YouTube videos about Jesus in India, and it kind of lays it all out for you. And people do a good job with those, those uh, you know, those videos. They're, they're not always sleekly produced, but they tell the story and they get the facts and they get the proof and, you know, they get the narrative. And so there are a couple of really good ones that I looked at um, when I was researching it. So Penelope, I, I found something about the Indian religion, influencer of the essence. What's that about? The, the Essenes, it's the Essenes. It's the, um, it's what I was saying that um, Moses could not become a ruler because he was, remember he was found in the bulrushes. He was a Hebrew, but he was, he was a prince and he would have been, would have studied the Egyptian mysteries and, and, and Hinduism. And then he freed the Hebrews, he bled them out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea. And then we have Mosaic Law, which is the, sort of the beginning of, of um, you know, the, the first five books of the Bible follow. And so Moses is the, you know, kind of the cornerstone of, of, the, of faith. And so it's, it's really through his connection to Egypt and India that, that you get that, um, that notion that the Essenes would have really, a lot of their belief system would have, would have flown through from that. And if some people argue that Jesus was an Essene, some people said he wasn't because he went to the temple and Essenes would not go to the temple um, because they considered it defiled and they didn't have any kind of animal sacrifice. Um, but he may have, you know, he may have been an Essene and, and, bu and bucked the trend because he went, Jesus went against a lot of um, teaching at the time. In fact, the new the New Testament is a, a lot of the New Testament is um, him revising yeah. or delivering a new message. And in the book, the message he's what I love about the New Gospel and Jesus teaching is, and it's in the book, and there, it's the reason for the three paintings. 
um, the, what the three paintings are supposed to achieve, what his two commandments were, which were love God and love one another. And in the book, it says, if there'd be absolutely no conflict in the world if we love God and we love one another. Yeah. But of course, it's impossible, right? It's, it's such a simple prescription, but it's an absolutely impossible thing to achieve. But in the book, it comes down to that, that it comes down to the paintings um, making that possible to love God and, and love one another. So I thought things were getting really complicated and we should just come up with a nice, simple formula to solve all our problems. So when Two commandments, three. <laughs> Penelope, when you put these three paintings together, does something magical happen? Uh, it, does it open a gate? Like, is there something that we should be looking forward to? Well, it's, I can't tell you because it's right at the end of the book. Um, but you, and that's what keeps you going. You want to know yeah. what um, what the what the what what happens. But it hopefully the person reading it. I wanted people to think deeply, you know, from their own side, uh, to contemplate these things and and uh, you know also kind of come to your own conclusions because it has some it has some you know interesting questions and Claire is motivated by grief. She's had this happy life. She's in her thirties. She's a painter. She loves her husband. They go hiking and he's he's a teacher and they just have these happy routines of this wonderful life and then he dies. And he's all of a sudden, she's just, her world is just blown apart. And that's talking about action, right? And your, yeah. the T, um, and her world is transformed now. She's gone from this very mundane, conventional, she's having like psychic experiences. She's tra channeling a masterpiece. She's having visions and she's grieving. And she is wants to believe that she'll find her husband again and which we all do when we love someone, yeah. when we lose someone that we love desperately, all we want, you know, for in, especially early on in grief, all you can think about is where are you? Where did you go? I want to see you again. Can I see you again? Should I go to a psychic? You know, you're looking for signs, looking for butterflies and dandelions and, you know, whatever symbols, because you just so you, you got a big hole blown in you and you, you want to fill it. And so, so she's, now she's open. So where some people might not think about God or spiritual matters because they're just going along in their life and, you know, making their tea and paying their bills. When you go through something traumatic, illness or loss or, you know, bankruptcy or whatever it is, and things kind of fall apart on you, then you then you start asking the big questions because you've got to dig down deep and find a way to go on, right? Yeah. And that that transforms you. It, 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 that, that's where the transformation comes in because the, the old way of thinking and being and doing, it doesn't work anymore. So you've got to enlarge it. You've got to expand it. You've got to, you, you've got to find new ways to think and act and cope. Yeah. So Penelope, when you're building your characters for your stories, are they res resonating with somebody that's in your life or has gone through your life or a part of you as well? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of me and Claire. I'm an amateur painter. I'm a painter, but I love to. I love. I'm, I'm a writer, but I love to paint. You, 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 you get a real uh, experience when you paint. It use a different part of your brain. It's a completely different. I think anybody who's got a hobby that they love, you know, if they gardening or painting or woodworking, whatever, it's it, it's meditative. It takes you into a different place. So I like the idea of her being an artist and she is a seeker and I have been affected by grief. You know, I've lost people that I love dearly and I know what that has done to me. I know what it's made me contemplate. And, you know, every time I lose someone, you, I have to like dig down and make a conscious effort to stay focused on gratitude and acceptance and moving forward because it's terrible when you get stuck and you start stagnating and rotting in place, you know, and as yeah. much as much as, and Claire has this problem in the book that in a way you don't want to move on. You don't want to let go of the person because you feel like you're betraying them, especially if it was a, a, a husband or, you know, yeah. spouse. but you have to, right? You have to, and then when you move forward and your life changes, you kind of find them in a different way. But you want to all, you want to hang on to the old way. You want to hang on to the old relationship. 
um, but as you move forward, you, they, they stay with you, but they just stay with you in a different way. It's I know anybody who's been through grief, which we all do if we live long enough, and some people are unfortunately experience terrible grief when they're very young. You know, I think little kids who lose parents, such a hard thing. But anyone who goes through grief, they understand the transformation that happens as you wrestle with it yeah. and let it change you. And so, Claire, there's new love coming into her life, <clears throat> trying to come into her life. She's trying to, she's becoming a different person, but the more she considers new love and becoming a different person, the further she feels away from, from her husband. So she's got this sort of this tension. Yeah, and like she, a tug of war, right? Yeah, so she talks to him. She wants to know how she can always keep him with her, but somehow move forward and accommodate all of these crazy things that are, you know, happening to her. So Penelope, what is it about angels that you love? I feel like I've loved angels since I was a kid. I think just the idea that they're, uh, we can't see them, that they're benign, uh, bene benevolent, uh, the symbology of angels. You know, I think one of the things in the book is the reason the new gospel is three paintings is because back in the Renaissance, before people could read, or before the printing press, the only way they told the, could tell the story about Jesus and his church was through these beautiful paintings. So, you know, you go into these great cathedrals in Europe and you see these amazing stained glass. If you go in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and you see da Vinci's Pieta of the Virgin Mary with the crucified Jesus across her lap, very moving. And, you know, all of the stained glass and the beautiful, the Sistine Chapel, every church, every Catholic ch church was adorned that way. And of course the reformers hated it. They thought it was idolatrous. And so they wanted to strip everything and you get those very, you know, you get the Baptists and you get the re reformed church and the Protestant uh, church. Um, and they're very, I know your peop people are from Germany, you get the Lutherans and it's all very stripped down because they want you to read the Bible and have a personal relationship with God through, through, your, through the word, through the Bible. And of course there's great value and merit, but, um, we lose touch with that visual splendor and we lose touch with what the direct experience when we look at um, inspirational art art because it we have a, it opens your soul you look at it and you you transcend your move when you look at the pieta in uh, in in st peter's you're absolutely you transform you're moved by it. it's just and uh you know gurdjieff said that great great works of art are are in they're insp they're divinely inspired right so that was the idea for the book that um, not, not, not that the word is not um, powerful, but it's just another expression of the word, which is to have the have the three paintings. Yeah. Well, and storytelling was told through art, right? And that's yeah. why art is so magical and so inspirational because it tells a story, and each person that looks at a at a painting will see something different than the next person, right? It goes back to that six and nine, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 symbolic, right? And and, and a symbol is something that um, generates um, profound associations in you. So if you look at a crucifix or you look at a um, any kind of a symbol, you know, a swastika, a negative symbol, you have a, a Superman. You know, you a Superman shirt. You have a deep resonance with it. You, it, it. you have a lot of associations. You know, back in England, we all of these massive castles they you know with the stone the stone castles and they have these tapestries that they put on the wall they keep the drafts out you know they they, they kind of like their wallpaper it kept the uh walls uh kept the rooms a bit warmer they'd have these big roaring fires but no central heating it'd be drafty castles you know but they also told the story so you'd have like the battle of Agincourt, you'd have these great battles and the tapestry would tell us you know they tell the story of the of the battle or and you forget that before people could read, the only way they really, I mean, they did oral traditions. So people would memorize like the Odyssey or, um, you know, Ulysses. People would memorize and tell it from memory. That's what the yeah. Druids did. They didn't write things down. It was all, um, it was all um, oratory. But um, the other way was through, through textiles and, and pain and, um, carvings and statues and wood, you know, yeah. wood, wood carving and um, 
in, well, the, the stories were told in the walls, right? Like to keep the castles warm, they put them onto the walls, right? Uh, the Egyptians, they wrote onto the walls as well, right? To tell the stories, uh, you know? And we forget how simple a story can be told by just looking through the arts, taking that time to pause and look through it and, and say, oh, okay, what was this message? And I, I really believe that because we're removing God and God from everything, that we're falling apart, right? We're losing faith, we're losing hope, we're losing, you know, we're getting frustrated. There's so much division. Yeah. That we need to start bringing it back. And maybe we need to start bringing it back through the arts and storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I think the postmodernism, you know, which is this period, um, postmodern period, I think started, you know, became very prevalent in the 60s and the idea of, you know, you have the grand narratives, right? The, the Ulysses, the Bible, uh, you know, great literature. And the postmodern said, no, you can make up your own story, your own interpretation. But to your point, you know, man's earliest instinct, even on cave walls, you know, they find those cave walls in uh, those walls in, um, it's, it's in France, where they've got the earliest um, drawings. And then back to yeah. the Egyptians, they had the hieroglyphics, right? Man wants to tell a story. He wants to memorialize. He wants to pass it on because there's deep meaning and there's deep meaning in story. And remember Aesop's fables when we were a kid and um, the parables in the Bible, they're symbolic stories that have a wisdom and a lesson. And when you start kind of tossing them aside and saying, oh, you can make up your own story or there's no, there's no great narrative that um, we should throw that all out. And even in music, you know, the great um, concertos and sonatas, the 1812 overture, it is to commemorate an event, right? It is it's telling the story through the music. So I think, um, so I, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good to come um, together around stories that unite us, that have, and when you look across different cultures, they very often have the same parables yeah. and stories. In Africa, oh. they, well, yeah, they've got a lot of folk tale. All of the folk tales, the the wisdom is embedded in the folk tale, and they're 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 the same across cultures. They're getting at the same wisdoms and the same basic truths about what it is to be, what it is to be human and to make your way in the world. Yeah, and that's what these tea times are about, right? Is storytelling, getting the stories out there, getting the the services and programs and books out there. Uh, you know, through a story, through an open conversation, because open conversation is also a story time, you know, uh, communicating with one another and just taking the time to pause. You know, uh, like I said before, we went live, Penelope, my, my Oma gave me my tea at the age of four and it was release, recharge and reflect. And that's exactly what we do during these conversations and, and these tea times, right, is we reflect on your words, we recharge each other through conversation and we release by giving out the sources and 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 words and stories out there as well yeah i love what you do i one of the night night i was telling you one of the great things of this of like doing a, a a little bit of a book tour and talking to people on podcasts because it's a spiritual book um i've had really wonderful conversations i mean there's only so much you can say about a book and I'm, i want people to rush out and buy it but it's the same thing you know it's this this the book is the same the story of the book is the same but it's been you and I were talking about heart to heart conversations and we just don't have I mean I was joking with my neighbor that I said I think I live in the Truman show because I drive by and I walk by and, and there's I never see any people we're sort of in a quiet you know like a wooded area but when I was growing up as a kid like people were out in the streets it's the kids were playing the women were chatting on the doorstep you were you'd have those conversations every day of your life and now i think that some people do but i think more and more we're atomized and isolated and you just each one of these conversations i've sort of said oh i just want to find I want, i'm going to meet an, a new person and have an interesting conversation and just be open to it and yeah. they've all been really enjoyable and it, it just you and I were also saying that you forget that other people are lis listening because you just because <laughs> we get in so much into the conversation and we're like, oh, there's people listening. listening yeah. yeah. Well, I'm doing all the talking. You're asking the questions, but but yeah, it's so nice to just because we look at people like they're strangers, 
Yeah. Um, but then if you have a deep, con you must find it with all of your guests, you have a deep conversation with someone or an in-depth conversation and you're not strangers anymore. You, you know, you see the common ground, you say, I could be friends with that person. Yeah. And I just don't think we do enough of that. We're not, we're not, we're not being as communal as we should be. Yeah. Well, it's like back in the day when a new neighbor moved in, right? You made a pie or cookies and you brought it over and you introduced yourself like, Hey, I'm your neighbor from three doors down. And you know, uh, if you need a babysitter, I, you know, like we're, we're not doing that anymore, right? We're not connecting. And I, I and I think it has a lot to do with the division, all of the coldness and, you know, uh, out there. Uh, and I hope that with these conversations together that we can open that door and have these conversations and have people bringing cookies and, and cakes and saying, you know what, I'm in that neighborhood. Like I live in that area. So like if any of my other tea time guests live close to you, you know, they could say, hey, Penelope, I was on Miss Liz and, you know, like let's have a cup of tea together, yeah. you know. So it's the connections, the bringing people to connect it, right? So, yeah, I I would love to. I mean, I'm very friendly. When I was a kid, I used to turn around on, bu on buses and start talking to people, and my mother would say, "Sit forward, sit, look, sit, leave them alone, leave them alone." <laughs> I just always assumed everyone would want to talk to me, you know. But um, I find that new people move into the neighborhood, and I want to go over and take them some spaghetti sauce or whatever, or some a box of tea. But you sometimes you get that feeling that people don't want you to intrude. So yeah. they're probably sitting there saying, "Gosh, where's the welcome wagon? Nobody invite you know welcome me into the neighborhood." So everybody's sort of uh, hedging and you know yeah uh, on guard, right? Eggshells yeah. like. Hey. And you know sometimes I've gone over with cookies or tea or whatever, and I just thought you know what the heck if they <laughs> if they if they don't take it in good part or they give me the evil eye that says you know don't knock on my door again, but someone's got to break the ice. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? Breaking the ice, having that conversation, opening that door and allowing someone to come to the table that you might not resonate with. Like you said, right from the get go, right? The opposite attraction uh, brings a, a different perspective to life and all that. Yeah. So Penelope, I want to get into your uh, word because your word that you gave me to describe yourself was curious. And you yeah. kind of just shared a little bit about it on the bus as a kid, right? So yeah. why that word curious? I always say, I, I've said this a million times, no matter who interviews me, I'll say it. Um, Dorothy Parker, who is a great like aphorist and wit, said that um, the cure for boredom is curiosity and there is no cure for curiosity. I just think curiosity is what moves us forward. Like yeah. we, as kids, we say, why, 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 why? And then I don't know, we get to the point where either our brains are stuffed or we think we know everything or we're just too tired to find out. But we stop being curious and your life changes. You know, you, you transform when you find, discover new things. And sometimes when I get in a, stuck in a rut and I'm having the same thoughts going round and round, I say, what do I have to do differently to think differently, right? How do I get out of this? How do I get an answer, solution to this problem? And so I, I, I'm, I just want to know things. I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be told. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you know, I, I want to learn from authority, um, but I'm just not going to swallow something because some someone says, and now with the internet, oh, what a time to live! Yeah. I say, I say this like when I was a kid, we had a library card and an out of date set of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you'd have to wait a hundred years for a new set, so all of your facts <laughs> were out of uh, you know, were out of date. But now you can, you can go on the internet and you can find out anything. And uh, I was saying to someone that uh, I was chatting with, because of this, you know, grief and reincarnation in the book, these near-death experiences, there's all of these channels with dozens and dozens and dozens of people who've had near-death experiences, and they recount them very sincerely and very, you can tap, they're telling that story Miss Liz, they're telling the story of they truly believe they had this near death experience and they can relate to you in absolute detail and with, with great believability. And it's just fascinating. You can yeah. have 10 years ago, you, you, you couldn't have gone on the internet and seen, now that's going to change your, I don't care who you are. Yeah. You may not wind up believing, you may say, oh, I've seen, you know, 97 of these people who've got, got one of these stories. And this, you know, there's researchers and oncologists and physicians who who have done the research and believe it. 
but just by being curious about it and finding all of that testimony and all of those that it it's changed my perspective on it i used to yeah. think i'd heard about it and i wanted to believe it we want to believe it but the more evidence that piles up the more people i see um i don't think i'm being gullible but i just i'm i'm getting very persuaded so right there just being curious about that one thing it's it makes all the difference, right? It, it, it does. It opens that door of transformation. Yeah. And now you're you ready know? to believe, entertain. Um, don't be gullible. You know, don't fall for nonsense. But now you're you're ready to entertain the idea and think about it. And how would it fit into your life? And how would it change your perspective and how you relate to people? And, yeah. you know. So Penelope, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, how could they reach out to you? They go to my website, um, PenelopeHolt.com. There's a couple of blogs up uh, up there. There's a book trailer. They can see my books and they can get in touch with me and send me an email, invite me to your book club. Uh, I like to hear from people. If you read the book and you enjoy it or you don't enjoy it, I prefer if you did enjoy it and write to me than if you didn't and write to me. But uh, I just like to hear from people. One chap, I was on the radio talking about, um, what was I talking about? I think Jesus being in a scene and reincarnation. And he'd studied it. He'd studied re reincarnation in Christianity. And he sent me this email with this long list of resources and information. I mean, this guy really knew his stuff. So, so that was, you know, that was, he educated me on it. So that was, that was fun. Well, it's always nice when you can learn from other people, right? Be oh, definitely. Opens that door, right? And that communication again, right? Connecting yeah. the dots. And, and having that conversation of, oh, I didn't know this. Oh, I'm learning this, you know, learning yeah. from one another. You know, yeah. I, I think it's a huge thing. I really want to thank you, Penelope, for joining me on Tea Time and sharing your story and your book. Uh, for anybody that would like to get the book, where can they get the book? Well, you can get it. If you, you can get it through a link on my website or you if you go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon or any, you know, online bookseller. I think a few bookstores may have it in stock, but they can certainly order it. But most people order their books online. And I think... I think Amazon gets it there pretty quickly. So Amazon is probably the best bet. But check well, out my awesome. website, penelopeholt.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you to the listeners out there. Uh, thank you to the viewers on Instagram. I do see you. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, thank you to the people on YouTube and uh, uh, Twitch. We had a couple people as well. So thank you for joining in and tuning in. Uh, I could not do this with all, all of you guys. I will be back tonight at 7 p.m. with the second TEA of this week with a returning guest, Bob Burrell, who is a screenwriter, and he'll be talking about his new book called Lancer's uh, Hero in the West, I believe it's called. So we'll be talking about that and talking about all of the updates that has happened since he's been last been on Tea Time. So until then, keep serving your tea, keep being real, and keep being true to yourself, and we will all make a difference together one cup of tea at a time.